Well, good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Harmon Museum's July Lunch and Learn. We're very fortunate today to have an author with us, an author of nine uh, books. Uh, they are mysteries, histories, and romance, perfect for summer reading or anytime you want to read a good mystery or romance. Uh, they all take place in various places. They're all part of a, a postcard series, and one of the neat thing is for us, two of those postcards are concerning Lebanon, Ohio. Uh, right in the middle we have uh, See No Evil, and the newest one I believe is Hear No Evil. Uh, and it deals with uh, 1969, Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, which the anniversary is 50 years from this Saturday. And while you're here, uh, with that in mind, don't forget to check out our Neil Armstrong display in that corner of the conference center, uh, which uh, I think you'll enjoy. Um, Carol Tonneson has written these books. She says it takes about a uh, year to write one. You might recognize her as one of our volunteers. She looks very much like the lady who helps works out with the, uh, the art department setting up our art displays, uh, which you also should see, the CF Payne upstairs. Well, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Carol Tonneson. I love seeing everybody here. This is just a great, great welcome for me. So my name is Carol Tonneson, but that's not my real name. My um, name is Donna Summers. But if, if you knew me as my second life, my other life, you would know that I actually taught at the University of Dayton and I wrote textbooks in my spare time. And so when people Google my name, they come up with four best-selling textbooks in the field of engineering. And that kind of puts them off doing any sort of reading of anything that I might come up with in my, my third life. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I really, really like Lebanon, Ohio, and I really, really like the Warren County Historical Society. They have been so welcoming and so warm and so much fun to work with. I'm here every Thursday and um, I work with Michael Cohen in the art department. I set up the display that was upstairs, the C.J. Payne display. Um, while everybody said, oh, a little to the left, a little to the right. <laughs> So I really like being here, and as part of my thank you to, to the uh, wonderful people at the Warren County Historical Society, if you buy a book today, or if you buy a book any day, $5 of the purchase goes to the museum. And so with that, I'll tell you about how I got into writing. But first, we're going to have a little quiz, because it's Neil Armstrong week, right? Right, and so Neil is my hero. I was nine years old when the moon landing happened, and we were out in Colorado visiting my, my father's uncle. And um, we were on our way back, and if you ever met my father, he was the kind of person who, he was not about the journey, he was about getting there. So, <laughs> so, so what happened is that we would drive all night and never stop to eat, and never stopped to sleep. And that was kind of my childhood, just driving from one location to another at warp speed. <laughs> and my mother would occasionally stop him. And she did on the night of um, the moonwalk. We were listening on the radio as it faded in and out. We were in Wyoming at the time. And the, the, the radio program on AM radio would fade in and out. And she was like, this is an important event. I want my children to witness this event. And so she firmly put her foot on the brake. She actually reached over with her foot and put it on the brake <laughs> in this small town in Wyoming. And we stopped at a store where there were other travelers who had stopped at this store. And the man in the store sold televisions. So his entire front window was, had different television sets. And even though it was a Sunday evening, he had all of them turned on to the moon landing, and he had piped it outside so we could hear what was going on. So I spent the moon landing with a whole bunch of people I didn't know, and it was an amazing, amazing moment, in, and I will never forget that. So my second meeting with Neil Armstrong was when I was at the University of Cincinnati. Of course, you guys don't know, but I'm a Lebanon resident. 
So going to the University of Cincinnati kind of made sense for me. And um, I was in the School of Engineering, and he was teaching in the School of Engineering, and we had the Moon Room, which was a, a conference room, and, and that's where he taught. He taught in the Moon Room, and I was lucky enough to have several classes in the Moon Room. And he had an office around the corner from where the Moon Room was, and I was standing outside his office looking at the um, answer key to some engineering problems that we were supposed to know how to solve. And I was kind of like a deer in headlights, <laughs> looking at these problems, going, oh my gosh, I am not going to make it through this program. It's going to just be as, as, it's just, just kill me now. And he came out of his office and he looked at me and obviously he saw what, what kind of, well, that, that kind of moment that you can really help somebody through, and he took the time to help me through that moment. He actually said to me, he said, don't worry. That's what we're here to teach you. And it was like a big, <sighs> here's my hero telling me that it's all, everything's going to be OK. And that was a really, really neat moment for me. And it actually started me thinking about the stories that people have to tell and the ideas that each of us have a story to tell. So I'm going to tell you my story today, but first we're going to talk about the moon. Who took the first selfie on the moon? Well, it was Neil. I mean, how could it not be Neil? There he is. See, he's, he's taking in the picture. That's him right there. He actually held on to the camera while Buzz did everything else. Buzz had a camera too, but Buzz didn't take any pictures of Neil on the moon to speak of. There are only five pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon. This is one of them that he took himself. This is his selfie. And I think that's pretty cool that he took a selfie on the moon. And then the next question is, what's a moon car? Well, that would be the technical car, but what's a moon car? We can each have a moon car here in the United States or in the world. A moon car is a car that has over 250,000 miles on it. <laughs> because the, the moon varies between 235,000 and 248,000 miles away. So any car over 250,000 miles, you've gone to the moon. Now you've got to get it back, <laughs> but you've gone to the moon. <laughs> So how many parts went into the Saturn V5 and the lunar module? I learned this last night. How many parts? How many? And this, as an engineer, this was just like, wow, really? <laughs> Nine million parts. Nine million parts, and each one of them had to work at better than 99.99999% accuracy. Because if they worked at 99.9% .9 accuracy, they would have had 1,200 parts that failed, and one of those could be important. So we don't want that to happen. Why did they land on the moon so late in the day? I mean, think about it. It wasn't prime time TV, right? <laughs> and we do everything in the United States. We can be on prime time TV. But why did they land on the moon so late? It wasn't their first location. Well, that would be part of it, because he had to go long. but. The main reason they did it is because there is no atmosphere on the moon. So since there's no atmosphere on the moon, you can't get the shading and the distance feeling that you can get with looking out into the distance and it gets all hazy and, and blue in the, in the distance. And you can't get that on the moon. Everything is sharp and clear, whether it's five miles away or whether it's a mile away or whether it's right next to you. So they landed so late in the day so the sun would be at an angle to let them see shadows so that they could tell which were boulders and which were not boulders. Let's see. How long was the first moonwalk? No, 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 keep going up. Two hours, two hours and, no, 13, 13 minutes. 
and Buzz Aldrin was on the moon a, a half an hour less than Neil Armstrong because he was the second person out and the, the first person that had to go back in. So how old was Neil Armstrong when he took his first plane ride? Five, six, he was six. There we go, we got six back in the back. So he was six years old when he took his first plane ride and he took it up in Warren County, Ohio. My husband's a pilot, so I know this. Um, in, in the city of Warren, Ohio, he took it up there. And if you go up there today, they have a mock-up of the lunar module and it has Buzz and Neil inside it at the end of the runway. And it's really cool to see. But what they're looking at when they look out their window is a McDonald's. So now we know what's on the moon, what they saw when they went up to the moon. <laughs> so let's see. How old was Neil Armstrong when he took his maiden flight on the Gemini 8, 1966? A little bit older. Nope. Oh, now you got it bracketed. He was 38. <laughs> yeah, he was 38 years old. So how old was he when he went to the moon? He was 40. He was 40. I learned this last night, too. Um, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were all the same age. They were all born in 1930, and they were all 5 foot 11, and they all weighed 165 pounds. And then there, the, the differences were, you know, their backgrounds and, and everything else. But I thought that was fascinating that the, the three of them were so similar to each other. So how many times did Neil Armstrong nearly die? <laughs> yeah. At least three times. And it was actually four times that he nearly died. In 1951, he was in the Korean War, and his plane got all shot up. And when he flew it back in, he ended up um, hitting a pole and tearing the entire right wing off. And so he had to eject at the last minute. And that was the only thing that saved him from caterwauling through the, the air. And then in the X-15, he was up in April 1962. He, the inertial guidance system of the X-15 rocket plane failed on him. And he had to, to hand fly this rocket and land it. And he was supposed to land in the Air Force Base, but he felt that landing it at the Air Force Base, that the, the runway wouldn't be long enough, so he flew it and took it to a dry lake bed, and he landed on the dry lake bed, and he just let the, 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 the gravity and the um, resistance of the ground slow him down. And he sat there for 15 minutes after he was in the plane, just kind of catching his breath. <laughs> it was the longest X-15 flight. It was also the fastest X-15 flight. And let's see, Gemini 8 went out of control in 1966, and he had to use retro rocket firing to get it back so that it would stop rotating. So that's the third time that he nearly died. And then he crashed the flying bedstead, which was to teach him how to fly the lunar module. It blew up on him, and he had to eject. So he's really kind of lucky that he actually got up to the moon and back. <laughs> And then the last question I have for you is, what did Neil Armstrong do when he could not afford to uh, get insurance on himself when he went to the moon? No one would cover him from an insurance point of view. And he wanted to leave his wife and, and kids something. So what did he do? He went and he signed photographs now, this is a man who would not sign anything. He, he was very private. He did not want anyone to uh, trade in his, in his signature and, or his photographs or his, his images. And he went and he signed hundreds of these photographs and told his wife that she could sell them if he didn't make it back. Isn't that amazing? He called them, and he called it his Apollo insurance covers. <laughs> you can imagine what they're worth today. So let's see what we've got here. You, you. All right, so this was um, a photograph that was taken by Bill Andrews. 
who was an astronaut with um, Apollo 8. And these guys were sent to the moon to, to do a circle to see whether or not we could get to the moon and get, us, get ourselves safely back. And when they did that, they came around the dark side of the moon and everybody wondered what the dark side of the moon was like and everybody wondered whether or not we, since we can't talk to people on the dark side of the moon, whether or not they would actually have survived going around the dark side of the moon. And when these guys came around, this is what they saw. And Bill Andrews took this picture. This is the moonscape and there's Earth. And I just loved his quote when he said, we'd come all this way to study the moon and what we found was the Earth. And this is really truly when the environmental movement began because people started to look at this and say, we've got just this little pretty ball out here in this black expanse of nothing and we sure better take care of our pretty little blue ball, otherwise we're not gonna have it in the future. And for all that Werner Braun Braun said that we would find other ways to survive and be able to go to different planets and live on different planets and come up with false atmospheres and things like that, who wants to leave the pretty blue ball? So that's pretty cool that that, that what we brought back from the moon. And then here's your last quiz question. Where is the Sea of Tranquility? Where is it? It's really easy to find. It really is. All you have to do is look for one, two, three, and this fourth one here. Whenever you look up at the moon, you'll know that the middle one is the Sea of Tranquility. I thought that was pretty neat because I was wondering how to answer that question myself. And I thought, what happens if it's here? <laughs> how do you look up in the sky and tell a seven-year-old that's where the Sea of Tranquility is? But it's right here, right here. So that's pretty cool. The reason I wanted to start with this is because the Postcard Mysteries Really, their driving force is the idea that I want to capture the voices of the people who experienced history. And that's really important to me. In each of these books, I've spent a lot of time talking to people, or actually listening to people. I'm better at listening than I am at talking. And um, I want to share their stories. So I want people to remember what it was like to be seeing the moon landing. And I want you to remember what it was like thinking about how frightening it was to send somebody to a different planet and to not know whether or not he was actually going to come back. So what I try to do is I try to capture the voice of people who have experienced history, and that would be you and me. That's not necessarily interviewing somebody who's, who's Neil Armstrong, for instance, but somebody who was watching Neil Armstrong. So that's what I did with See No Evil, A Postcard to Burglar. This is, this, was, this is the only postcard that I've ever found that shows Lebanon, Ohio that doesn't have the golden lamb in it. <laughs> so people ask me, where do you get your ideas for your books and how do they start? And I could tell you all kinds of things about taking English classes and stuff like that, but that wasn't how my life unfolded. I, um, I started reading when I was about four years old. And the reason I started reading at four years old was because my mother left me at the crisis point in Mother West Wind's Reddy Fox. And it was the first time that I had ever known that there was a crisis point where everything has come to a big head and what are we gonna do and how are we gonna solve this mystery? And it was Reddy Fox and he was just in a bad way. And mom said, I gotta make dinner. <laughs> so, so there, there I am going, Mom, you can't leave me, begging her. No, nope, your dad's coming home, we've got to make dinner, got to make it all happen. And I sat down with the book, and I finished reading the book. I actually sounded out all the words and came to Mom, and, and she said, I'll read that to you tonight. And I said, oh, no, I'm done. <laughs> I finished. I got it. And she questioned me to the point where she knew that I had actually read the book and it was probably the last time she ever read to me, <laughs> which was unfortunate, but um, that's where my career started. And so the first thing I know about writing books is that you gotta have a crisis in it because you've gotta get everybody all built up and then they don't wanna put the book down. So that was the first thing I learned about writing books. The second thing I learned about writing books was that dogs don't talk. See, I was nine years old 
this was after my summer vacation with my dad and the moon thing, and we had to write a story. And I wrote a story about my dog, and it was a cute story, I must say. And the dog could talk. And, and I thought dogs could talk at that time. And I got a C minus on it. And my mother, I came home, and that was really the first time I realized that I could write, and I could write well. And I was really angry about the whole C minus thing, because I could understand that I didn't get the score that I thought I deserved. And my mom went in and talked to the and told her that dogs did talk. Because that was the only reason I got the C minus, was that dogs don't talk. And if you read my books, you'll see that the dogs do talk. <laughs> so the next thing that I learned was that um, that there is such a thing as appropriate English, and that books are meant to be written so that they flow, and that you're supposed to write outlines, and you're supposed to do your research, and you're supposed to have your paragraphs and outlined, and how. And so that's how I started my first book. The first book is um, down at the end, The Red Bus. And I outlined the complete book. I knew exactly what each character was going to do, what their names were going to do. I had a spreadsheet that showed who and what was going to happen and what chapter everything was going to happen in and what was going to happen in each chapter and who the characters were and what their motivations were. And that was all fine, well, and good. And then I started writing, and the people just walked on the stage, and they just started acting out. <laughs> and that's when I learned that Basically, there's writing, and then there's, there's writing with people in your head. And I have a tendency to write with a lot of people in my head. And so I'll get really quiet. And it's because I can hear these people, and they're running around up there, and they're making a lot of noise. And it's kind of overwhelming. But every once in a while, people will see me, and I'll be standing there just going, OK, <laughs> I'm seeing this. I can see what's happening. So. That brings us up to me going to college. And I went to college in engineering because I also happened to be very good at math. And that was something that girls didn't do at that time. We certainly did not go into engineering. There were two of us out of 670 some odd men. And Carolyn and I became very good friends <laughs> because, <laughs> because it was just Carolyn and I. And, um, and I really, really had a good career really had a very good career in engineering. And I wrote textbooks in engineering. And the reason I wrote textbooks was because while I was at the University of Cincinnati, I was getting my PhD. And women didn't get PhDs. I, I got the 216th PhD for a woman in engineering in the nation in all the years that they've been offering PhDs. And um, the number's not that much higher now, which is unfortunate, but anyway. So I got number 216, and when I turned in my um, thesis, I happened to be standing outside of one of the teacher's rooms that was reading my thesis to give me a, a um, grade on it. And he said to his companion in there, if this woman ever finds out that she can write, we are all in trouble. <laughs> and I thought, oh, OK. So I started writing, and that's when Prentice Hall found me. And Prentice Hall has been supportive of me for the last 30 years of textbook writing. And I still write textbooks. I still flip on my math switch. Um, I have retired from the University of Dayton for health reasons. But other than that, I'm OK now. And I started writing books. And I changed my name. So I got my name because the Carol is my mother's name, is also my middle name. And that was pretty easy because everybody was always calling me Carol while I was growing up anyway. So, so I do actually respond to Carol. I don't care if you call me Carol or you call me Donna. It's OK. And Tonneson is my mother's maiden name. Um, we are Norwegian. And I looked it up online. There are no Carol Tonnesons uh, that exist. <laughs> so, so I figured I wasn't stealing somebody else's life. That was important to me. So let's talk about the books. This one, See No Evil, A Postcard to a Burglar, was one that I started because everybody was asking me why I didn't write about Lebanon, Ohio. I mean, I grew up here. I live here now. I enjoy Lebanon, Ohio, but why didn't I write it? And the real reason is because 
I have to wait for a postcard to find me. I have a lot of people who ask me, do I collect postcards? The answer is no. I don't have a big box full of postcards at home that I go through when I'm ready to write something. I actually wait for the postcard to find me. I found this one when I was at a flea market up in um, Columbus, Ohio. And I thought it was a beautiful forecourt of a motel. And then I realized, oh, that's actually the Shaker Inn out there in Lebanon, Ohio. And so I came home and I thought, well, this will be a good one. And I actually kept it for about a year before the thoughts came to me. And, and it, was just, it was just a hoot to write. So I started out, and I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to have Riley Wills come in. And I picked the name of Riley Wills because that's the street that I learned to drive on. And any of you who have been on Riley Wills Road know that it's, it's about this wide. And, and it's really curvy. And my mother said, here, take over, drive. So that's where I learned to drive. And I always thought it would be a good name for a character, Riley Wills. And so he flies into Lebanon, Ohio. And he's going to go and stay at the Golden Lamb. And he can't get a room at the Golden Lamb, so he ends up at the, the, um, the Shaker Inn, although it's not called the Shaker Inn in the book. And at that point, the book took a complete turn and took my outline, and I might as well have just ripped it up. Because at that point, one of my dearest friends walked onto the scene. He's, he, Riley Wills is walking out of the Golden Lamb, and he's about to walk around the corner and go up the street to the Shaker Inn. And June, those of you who know June, walked into the book, and she fed some biscuits to Riley Wills' dog. And that would be OK, except that there was no dog. <laughs> and there was no June. And then Gloria, another friend of mine who knows June, walked on the scene and said, well, if June is going to be in the book, then I've got to be in the book, too. <laughs> and, and that just got the whole ball rolling in a totally different direction. It was, it was a challenge for me to get everybody lassoed and onto the book pages, because everybody wanted to be themselves in the book. There is a list of people in the front of the book, if you read the, um, the front matter of the book, you'll see that there's a list of people who wanted to be in the Lebanon book. And they all marched onto the scene. And I asked each one of them, you know, can I use you in the book? And they were all very nice and said, yes, as long as you don't make us look stupid. <laughs> so, so this book is Murder and Mayhem and Monkeys in Lebanon, Ohio. And I have a group of women who I'm very dependent on. They come to my house, and we have punch and cookies and, and play games. And then we talk about my next book. And they gave me all kinds of ideas, which I think they had too much eggnog. I think that we were drinking eggnog that had something in it. Because we started getting on this monkey topic, and, and suddenly the circus was coming into Lebanon, Ohio. And I'm going, guys, this is not the book I had planned. I just wanted your opinion on a few little things. And now there's murder and mayhem and monkeys in Lebanon, Ohio. So that's that book, which is See No Evil. Because I don't know whether you remember this, but you said you wrote one book about Lebanon, Ohio. You know, Neil Armstrong days are coming up. Why don't you write another book about Lebanon, Ohio, and put Neil Armstrong in it? And I was like, no. <laughs> it takes me about a year to write a book. And she asked me this in January of this year. And I was rather nervous about that, because of course, how am I going to get everybody all together? How am I going to get it all outlined? How am I going to do all the appropriate research? And when I talk about appropriate research, I actually interview people. I go to the area, wherever the book has taken place, I go to the area. Well, with that was pretty easy, because I could just kind of fall out of bed. And I was already in Lebanon, Ohio. But I had a lot of people to interview, and I had a lot of Life magazines to read. And so I told her, oh, yeah, I'll think about it. Not. <laughs> and I went the next day. Well, actually, what I told you was that I would write a book if I found a postcard of Neil Armstrong on the moon. And then I made a little mental note, do not touch any postcards at the <laughs> flea market tomorrow. Please do not touch any postcards. And so I walked through the flea market, keeping my eyes averted from anything that looked like paper or reading material. And what happens is 
I find this postcard. It's laying on top of a pile of embroidery work or something like that. And I'm going, why me? Why does this have to happen to me? What, what did I do to deserve having to write this book? Because, I mean, it's a lunar module, and it's a postcard from Wapakoneta. I mean, how can I not write a book about Neil Armstrong and Wapakoneta and 11 in Ohio because I found this postcard? So I very calmly tucked the postcard in my pocket, paid my 50 cents for it, and I said, I just won't tell her that I found it. <laughs> and then I went to the next booth, and one of my favorite things to do is to find reading matter that's appropriate for the, the period. And this guy is selling Life magazines from 1969 and the whole 1960s period. And I'm looking at them and going, oh good, they're $15 a piece, that means I can buy one. Because I'm, I'm actually pretty cheap when it comes to spending money on something I don't want to do anyway. And so I carefully selected this one Life magazine. I go walking over to the nice man to give it to him. My girlfriend's standing behind me going, will you just get on with it and pick a magazine so we can see the rest of the flea market? And I walk up to the man to pay my $15 for my One Life magazine, and he goes, I'll give you the whole box for, for $10. And I'm just going, OK, now I have to write the book. Now, I don't have any choice now. I have to write the book. And that's, that's how these books get started. It isn't me saying, I want to write a book about Indianapolis, or I want to write a book about Michigan. It's, it's more that the postcard and the, the information find me. So this book is set in 1969. It has, still has Riley Wills in it and Eve. They're eight years later because the first book is set in 1961. The little boy in it has grown up, and he's giving presentations on Neil Armstrong's adventure on the moon. And of course, June is back with her biscuit bag. And what are you going to cover in 1969? Well, America was tuning out, stoned up, they, you know, there was a lot going on. And so we could tune in, we could turn out, we could turn off, we could do a number of different things in 1969, and I chose to deal with the drug culture of 1969, the women's movement of 1969, a little bit of the environmental movement of 1969, and of course, Neil. So that's Hear No Evil, a postcard on a party line. And then we'll talk about this one, The Golden Isles, A Postcard to Fear. This one got its name, A Postcard to Fear, because I interviewed 12 women who were, it's set in 1942, by the way. I interviewed 12 women who were alive at that time, and they were young women at that time, and they were uh, in their early 20s at that time. And their stories are in here. This was a very important book to capture the tales of what it was like to be at home during World War II, and what it was like to be a Rosie the Riveter character. And so the woman in here is an industrial engineer. She doesn't know that, but that's what she is. And her friends are Riveters and people like that. They do the USO shows. The women I interviewed talked about how uh, one of them lived up in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And her mother had parties every weekend for the men who were at the, um, the naval base that was right there. And so that's where she met her future husband, too. And so when you read this book, there are lots and lots of stories in here that are real life stories of the women who I talked to. And the reason it's called A Postcard to Fear, to fear is because the women in it, when I started asking the question about what was it like, the one woman said, I was there when they were sinking the ships off the coast of the United States. And she was at a small college just north of where this book takes place. And she could feel the heat from the boats that had been sunk as they burned offshore, she could feel the heat blast against her face as a 19-year-old. And her, when I was interviewing her, her entire face just turned into this mask of fear. And I really think at that point I understood what the problem was or, or what, 
what she was feeling. You know, and, um, and that makes the book sound terribly depressing, but it's not, because it's basically a book about what it was like to be 20 years old at that time, and the excitement of being 20 years old and being involved in a very busy, busy time, and being able to break boundaries and be somebody who you didn't expect to be. The other thing about this book is that it's one of the few times that I actually used somebody I know personally, some event that happened in my own life in, as part of the book. A lot of people ask me, you know, do you tailor your, your people after somebody you know? And unless I have credited them in the front, the answer is no, I don't. These people all are made up, uh, except for June and Gloria. The, um, but the people in the front of this one where she says, I should have married Ray, that actually happened to me. My great aunt was married to my uncle, Ray, uncle Jay for 65 years, and I went to their 65th wedding anniversary. They actually made it to 72 before they, they both died about two years ago at 100. And they were both really active until then because Uncle Jay was on the roof of the house fixing the antenna when he was 99. And I showed up and I was like, oh my God, he's going to fall and that's going to be the end. And he just hopped around up there like a little monkey. Anyway, so I'm sitting there at the 65th wedding anniversary and, and he's written a poem for her. He's gotten her flowers. And so we had cake and ice cream and all that fun stuff. And then he went in to listen to his radio program and no sooner than he goes into the other room and we hear the radio go on, of course it was really loud, she looks at me and she goes, I should have married Ray. <laughs> and I was just, I mean, this is my great aunt. This is somebody who's been married longer than I have been alive and to the same guy. <laughs> and she actually, uh, Ray had died the month before. Ray was the first love of her life. He was an Englishman. Her mother did not allow her to marry him. And they kept up a correspondence for 65 years. And she gave me the papers, which of course I disposed of without reading because it was personal. But she didn't want Jay to find them. And I was like, well, if he hadn't found them in 65 years, I don't think we have a problem here. <laughs> but that's, that's what got this started. I should have married Ray. So that's my 1942 book. It takes place in Brunswick, Georgia. I went to Brunswick, Georgia. I spent days in their tiny little, I guess it would be an archival room that was beneath the uh, library. And they weren't, it's, you know, it's just not as nice as here. <laughs> it, it just, it was a dark, damp room and it felt like the seawater had been in it a little bit too long. But I did all the research there for this book. This one is a fun read. It's a fun beach read. It's called Rum Runner's Reef. It's the second book where I start out with something that happened to me. And this one is, I was down in the Florida Keys and I had found this postcard. I was wondering what to do. The postcard is from Isla Morada, Florida. It was sent to a, his, the man's brother who lived in Cleveland, Ohio. I found it at a Cleveland, Ohio junk store. And the, um, the postcard just, you know, says, you know, most postcards are, hi, how are you, and the weather is fine. Well, they've been writing postcards like that since aught nine. So, but I wondered, how many people are in Isla Mirada, Florida in 1927, and what did they all do there? Because today it's a big luxury place to stay, but back then it was Hurricane Central. And so I found out that there were 17 people living in Isla Mirada, Florida at that time, because I went to the archives and I found all this information out, and every one of them was a rum runner. So, so I was like, well, this will be fun. I can write about rum running. This will be great. So in the beginning of this book, when you read it, there's a, there's a woman who is sitting on a pier, and she is looking out over the ocean, and she's calm and relaxed and everything, and this 
naked man comes up out of the water and walks across the pier and gets in the water on the other side. That actually happened to me. And I came back and I told my husband what was going on. And I said, you know, he was really, really good looking. All of him was really, really good looking. <laughs> but I was like, okay, so that was a weird moment because he did. He just got up out of the water and walked across and then went down the other side and he was gone. And I have no idea who he was or where he came from or where he went to, but he became the introduction because my husband said, that's a great start of a book. And I was like, well, okay, so that's what we'll do. Whoever he is, yeah, whoever he is. This book, The Highlands, is set in Scotland, but it actually didn't start in Scotland. It started here in Lebanon, Ohio, because I had some veterinarians who were friends of mine over for dinner to thank them for taking care of my animals, because I live on a farm, and I wanted to thank them for taking care of my animals throughout the year. And they, they got together and they just started going, you never write about veterinarians. No one ever writes about veterinarians. Why don't people write about us as veterinarians? You know, and they said, James Harriet, that's the only guy that ever wrote about what it was like to be a veterinarian. And my comment was, veterinarians are the good guys. So you can't really expect to be in a murder mystery because you guys are the good guys. And they said, oh, we can be bad. And they proceeded to regale me with all kinds of stories about how, what it was like to be a bad vet. So that's where this whole thing got started. And I actually called up, the one is, is the younger vet. He is, he is sort of the model that I use for the younger vet in here. And the other one is an older vet. And he sort of is the model for the, the older vet. And I called up the younger vet and I said, if you were, if you were, there's a, there's a comment, you are a vet, you are a young vet, what would you tell to an older vet? What would be the one thing that you would say to an older vet if you could just say it? You didn't have to worry about your job. And then I called up the, and of course I got his answering machine because they're busy. And then I called up the older vet and I said, what's the one thing that you would say to the younger vet? And they both called back within five minutes of each other. The younger vet said, I would tell the older vet that he needs better equipment, more computers, more technology. And the younger vet message that the older vet said to the younger vet was, it's about the people. You got to take care of the people when you talk about animals. And I thought, you guys need to talk to each other. <laughs> so this book set in Scotland. And I did go over to Scotland. I do, my husband used to work for a Swiss firm, so we spent a lot of our time early in our marriage, the first 20 years or so, going to Europe and spending a lot of time in Europe. And so I have a lot of friends in Europe, including my friends in Scotland. And so they invited me over to get a, pick up a dog and, because I have a sheep farm and I need sheep dogs on my sheep farm. And so we went over to get the dog and I had already started the vet book and they said, well, why don't you put it here in Scotland? Why don't you add the, the idea of going to different sheepdog trials? So we went to nine sheepdog trials in eight days. That's a lot of sheep. <laughs> and my husband swears it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> and, and I, on the other hand, am quite enthusiastic about it. So if you want to ever talk about sheepdog trials and see my seven billion pictures of sheepdogs working sheep on sheepdog trials, that would be a fun evening. Maybe. Um, but this is considered my sweetest book. And remember I told you that, that I find books that are the right, the right support for it? This is a book of Robert Burns' poetry. It's from 1872. And I was at a flea market and I was trying to figure out how to get the people in this book to fall in love with each other because basically they were at odds with each other all the time throughout the entire book. And I wasn't happy with that because it's supposed to be a little mystery, a little history, and a little romance. And we were definitely on the outs with the romance part. So I'm at this flea market and there's this man there and he's got a table about as big as, oh, probably as big as one of these white ones. And he's got it stacked with books, stacked with books. And they're all really old books. He must have emptied somebody's house out. And he was selling them. And this red book was on the top of the heap. 
And I picked it up because it was a red book on the top of a heap of gray and black and beat up books. And I looked at it and I went, this is the poetry of Robert Burns. And I had set this book in Ayrshire, which is where Robert Burns is from. And Robert Burns wrote Old Lang Syne, and just in case you wanted to know who he is, he wrote the, the music and the words to Old Lang Syne. He also wrote some of the most beautiful poetry I've ever read. So I'm holding this book reverentially saying, this is the answer to all my prayers. This is how they're going to fall in love. They're going to quote Robert Burns to each other because he's all about love poetry. And the guy walks up to me and he says, that their book? That their book's about George Burns? You know that funny guy? <laughs> I'm just going, this is, this is, I'm trying to have a moment here. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm really trying to just zen for a minute. But I gave him his dollar for his book, and then I went and zenned elsewhere. So you can see how much I've used out of it for the, uh, the book. So this is considered my sweetest book. I thought that was very interesting that it went from my, my these people are going to rip each other's eyes out, to my sweetest book. And it was really, it was just a joy to write. It was just a truly a joy to write. The, um, I keep forgetting I have to use this little device. This angel share book is because everybody loved the people who were in the, the uh, highlands so much they wanted them to come back in the angel share book. And that one, I must have goofed somewhere in it because it's, it's a charming little read, but it has whiskey. And I think that people are afraid to read books about alcohol because it's not, it's not a very popular book because everybody picks it up and says, oh, it's about whiskey making. It's like, well, no, that's just the backdrop. But there seems to be some hesitancy, so don't put it to the side. Give it a, give it a, tr a try. It's actually quite cute, and it's, it's a postcard to a dead man. Do you see that it's a picture of a graveyard? I wondered when I saw it, who sends pictures of graveyards to each other? And I looked on the back, and it's from an undertaker, from one undertaker to another undertaker. And I thought, how did I not know that? How did I not know that? The Zephyr is a short story that I wrote to put on Amazon. It is only available online, and it's free on Amazon. So if you'd like to read it, you can read it on your computer. The Fishing Bridge is my second book that I wrote. It is all about the um, Yellowstone National Park. And when you read it, realize that in 1950, when the book is written, Yellowstone Park didn't look anything like what it looks like today. They've moved some of the geysers, not because they wanted to, but because that's what nature does to us. Some of the geysers that were in parking lots are no longer there, and so they've paved them over. And other places, the, the, the um, the geysers have changed color. So this book, I get a lot of complaints from this book. I went to Yellowstone and I couldn't find this geyser and I'm like, well, I'm sorry. This is a 1948, 75th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park guidebook that I found at some flea market or another. And so I got the geysers correct. I did go out there and spend three weeks on a dude ranch while I was writing the book. And the most fun I had was I got this 19-year-old kid, truly wants to be a cowboy. And he gave me all this cowboy logic that he was living to. And so that became the story of the uh, young man in the book. He wants to become a cowboy. And the other thing that he liked to do was I'd say, well, I need to, I need to have somebody die. And he's like, I know just the place. <laughs> I was like, OK, let's go out and find out where we can kill somebody. It's like, you know, what is it with men? What's up with that? So let's see what else do I have here. In the, um, the Red Bus is my first book. And I wrote it because, and I, usually I start with that, but I had to start with Neil this time. So I went backwards in time instead of forwards in time. The Red Bus is my first book, and I wrote it because like I told you, I was very ill, and my husband was trying to find things for me to do while I just basically wanted to pull the covers over my head and just have it over, please. And so I went with him to the hardware store. That's, a, that's an exciting trip. 
And so he dropped me off at the hardware store. Next to the hardware store was a antique store. And I went in and the first thing I saw was old European postcards, 50 cents. And I could see the entire book at that point. It was really, it was a strange moment. And then I found this guidebook to London. And that's just started the whole book. It took me a while to get on a roll with it, but, but that's what really started the whole book was to be, to find that postcard and to be able to look into the postcard and see the entire story. And that's how I know that I have the right postcard because I can pick up hundreds of postcards. I do not have a postcard collection. I can pick up hundreds of postcards and they can leaf through my fingers and none of them will touch me. And then I'll be at, like I was at a jewelry store of all places that was selling goth jewelry. I was with a friend of mine who was really into the whole goth thing. And so there I was and I'm looking down and there's a pile of postcards and I'm going, why not? I'm not into goth jewelry so I can look through the postcards. And that's when I found the one that's, this lovely one that's on the front of the Border Collie book, the Scottish book, was in that pile of them. And I knew as soon as I saw it that that would be the postcard for the veterinarian book. So I've saved my best for the last. This was a moment. And in case you can't tell, I go to a lot of flea markets. Actually, I go to one a month. That's all I'm allowed. <laughs> one a month. And at one of the flea markets, I found a Xerox box. You all know what those look like. You know, you can see them there down here. I found a Xerox box that was full of junk. And the sign on the Xerox box said, everything in the box, one dollar. Take the whole box for a dollar. And all I wanted was this postcard on the top. And I offered the lady, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll double your profit. <laughs> I'll leave you with the box and I'll take the postcard and I'll give you a dollar for it. She was like, no, you have to take the whole box. I don't want to carry the whole box home. And I was like, I don't really want to carry this around. Because, I mean, it's a heavy box. It's a big box and it was early in the flea market and I didn't want to carry it. And so we argued. I got up to $5 and she was like, no, you have to take the whole box. And I was like, okay, fine, I will take the box. I will just take the box. So we took the box back to the car and I forgot about it until I got home and then I went, I took the postcard off the top and I went to dump the box into my garbage can. And when I did that, on the bottom of the box, I found 16 love postcards. And this, this young lady here is a nurse, a French nurse in 1918 who fell in love with an American army captain. And well, who's not to like 16 love postcards? I mean, seriously. It was just too cute. And this gentleman here is my grandfather. And I had wanted my whole life to do something for him, to do something that would, that would, uh, oh, just kind of put a nice cherry on the top of his life. And these three men that were with him, my mom and I, when he passed away at the ripe old age of 93, we went through all of his things and we found dozens of pictures of those four of them together up until 1918. And we don't know the names of the other three men, but we do know that they did not survive World War I. And my grandfather never spoke about World War I, but knowing what I know now about it, and what I wrote in the book about it, there was, there was a lot going on and there was a lot of sacrifice. And there's a reason why these people did their best to rebuild the world afterwards. So I wanted to combine the two of them, so to honor them, and that's what that book is all about. And before you think that it's gonna be a depressing book, I teamed up with a friend of mine who bought me at an auction. She bought a character in the book and I was like, okay, so this is the book I'm writing. It's, it's set in Paris. She liked that. She spent most of her life growing up in Paris. And uh, so she was really happy with that, but I couldn't, I couldn't pin her down as far as the character. I was like, I have to get this book out of my head because there's people running around up in there and I can't, I'm not sane when I have people running around in my head. 
So can you pick a character? And she didn't want to pick a character, and she, and she well, we played around with, did she want to be one of the lead character's nurse friends? Did she want to be the landlady of the nurse's home? Did she want to be the head nurse? Did she want to be da 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 And this went on for three months. And she was having a lot of fun just meeting me for lunch. I think that was the whole point. <laughs> I think that she wanted, that she thought that I would stop as soon as she picked a character. But that wasn't the whole point. The whole point was to have her character in the book. And so finally, I said, well, tell you what, the doctor has to have a mother. Because she wanted to be about 60. And I was like, well, that's fine. So the doctor has to have a mother. And I'll even make you a countess if you'll pick this person, <laughs> just take somebody. And she said, well, I was almost a duchess. Remember what I told you about catching people's lives and people's backgrounds and listening to who they are and what they have to tell you? And she told me, she said, well, I was almost a duchess. And I looked at her and I was like, and you ended up marrying a dentist in Lebanon, Ohio? So how'd that happen? <laughs> Seriously. She was uh, engaged to marry a duke of France, and World War II happened. And she, her parents took her out of, um, she was at the Sorbonne, and her parents took her out of school and brought her back to Washington, D.C. And they, you know, it went from negotiating for an appropriate marriage to a rupture. When they got back together after the war, the same feelings weren't there, and she never did marry and become a duchess. But that's who she is. She's the duchess in this book. And she told me a lot about what it was like to be young in World War II. And I put a lot of that in here. And she made the book really, really funny, really, really entertaining. And so if you think you're going to be reading a sad story, it's not a sad story at all. It's actually quite entertaining and quite funny. So let's see, what else can I tell you about writing the books? There's two things that I really want to get across to you is that everybody's got a story to tell, and writing is the best way to put it into, to, or speaking about it is the best way to capture that for your family and your friends. But realize when you're writing that, that and this is the second point, you all have something to capture. You all have something to share. But in writing, sometimes the people in the book, sometimes they just take over. And if that happens, just go along for the ride. <laughs> because once, once you get started, it's really it's all about the, the journey. It's all about the, the activity that you're taking place with. It's all about the memories that you're sharing. It's all about what you're trying to capture for the future. And that's what these books are all about. There's, there's a lot of history in each of them. But there's also murder and mayhem and monkeys. And then there's a little bit of romance, because all of us need a little bit of romance in our lives. So thank you very much.